Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfi. If you enjoy this programming, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Join Truth and Rhythm's membership program through Patreon. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkandstuff.net. At that site, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I am honored to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, renowned in jazz, R&B, and funk keyboardist, singer, multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, and musical director, Patrice Russian. Flying out of the gate in the early 1970s as a teen, she released a trio of jazz funk albums before putting together a run of six straight top 30 R&B albums and seven top 30 singles, from 1978 to 1987. Those hit singles included the heavy grooving, Hang It Up, Haven't You Heard, and Forget Me Nots. Having also performed countless sessions for others, she returned to her jazz roots in the late 1970s while also expanding into television and film. Among the notable artists she has worked with are Lenny White, Najee, Gerald Albright, Ronnie Laws, Sonny Rollins, Donald Byrd, Herbie Hancock, Herbie Hancock, Carlos Santana, Stanley Clark, Prince, Tina Marie, Paul McCartney, George Duke, Shaka Khan, Quincy Ju Jones, and Babyface. And she continues to do live shows. Patrice, thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm great. And thank you so much for having me on the show. My pleasure. Where are you today? I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, this is my home studio setup, you know, so uh, keeps me out of trouble and keeps me busy. Got my drums over here and I've got keyboards all around and all kinds of stuff, you know, so uh, it allows me to be able to have a space at home to be able to to work on music and uh, rehearse with friends and things like that. All the toys real handy. Yeah. Yes. So I'm a fellow Los Angelino. So you know that from the get go. And so, mm -hmm. you know, got the representing. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I've had so many of your colleagues, you know, on the show previously, and a lot of them from that you know, center there, you know, you're the Paul Jackson's and your Cornelius Mims and, you know, uh, um, um, oh man, um, background singer. Oh, uh, let me see. It would be Josie James, maybe Lynn the Davis. other one, the other one that worked with George Duke. Oh yeah. Josie, Josie James. N no, the other both one that worked with George them. also worked with George Duke. Um, not Lynn, Lynn Davis. Lynn Davis. Yeah. Lynn Davis. Oh, man. She'll yes. be mad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all of those cats have been on, so I'm so glad nice. that you could finally join the show, too. Cool. Very cool. You were a child prodigy going way back. Um, what were a couple of key developmental things that happened along the way that kind of shaped you into you as a young artist? Hmm. You know, that's a great question because I think there was, it was a combination plate, <laughs> you know, a combination of situations and circumstances that I think were part of what just gave me permission to just do, just be. So I would say first and foremost would be my parents because they, although they, they were, um, you know, ardent 
music lovers, you know, they didn't really play music. The whole idea was 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 they always had records. The radio was always on. Television was on. They belonged to a record club where they received vinyl, you know, every month. And, and, the, and, and it was called the Columbia Record Club. And they would receive, you know, Brahms one week, Miles Davis the next. I mean, you know, it would be all these different sorts of music and, and music makers from all kinds of idioms. So I heard the popular music of their time. I heard the, the you know, the jazz that they, of their time and, and, and certainly uh, uh, classical music, folk songs, uh, music of the Freedom Riders, all kind, whatever they were sent. We put a stack of records on, on weekends and it would just play and play and play and play and play. So that was the first thing. The music didn't have categories that were so strict. It was just, this is music. You love it or you don't. You like this song or you don't like this song. You know, you love this artist or you don't like this artist, whatever. The other part of it, I think, that was a part of that permission was that I had great teachers. I've had three uh, piano teachers in my life, which meant that I had them each for a pretty long time. The very, very first one uh, was actually, he was actually a, a, a graduate student, but his his he was open, you know, to so many different kinds of music that my lessons, uh, you know, became uh, tools, tools to be able to address music, regardless of the fact that I was learning classical music as the, uh, you know, platform for learning the piano. My second teacher I had for the longest time, I had, uh, I had Dorothy Bishop uh, from like age maybe nine until I was 17. And her ability as a teacher to, I think, very deftly uh, uh, make the le each lesson relevant, whether I was prepared or not. And so I would come in and maybe I'm, you know, I'm a kid, so maybe I didn't really practice this week, or maybe I didn't really, you know, do what she asked me to do in terms of a particular piece or whatever. But she said, well, what did you do this week? So I would say, oh, I learned this Marvin Gaye song from the radio, or I learned this Beatles song. And she would say, play it for me. I mean, with all seriousness and interest. And, you know, I would play it. And I don't know how she did it. I still don't really know how she did it. But she would take the idea that we were supposed to be studying in this Mozart piece or Haydn piece. She would talk about motifs and colorization and things like that and apply it to the thing that I had just played for her and say, see, that concept is right here. And that would get me back on track to the lesson. I mean, it was marvelous. And I had her for such a long time. Of course, I didn't appreciate that then. I, I certainly do now because I realized how important the style of teaching to accommodate the style of learning allows for there to be a certain kind of feeling of empowerment and discovery, which all students have to have. So uh, that was the, that one. And then the last one that I'll say was, 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 was key was in high school. And that was during the time that, you know, some of the people that you've uh, cited in your intro, Ndugu Chancellor, Gerald Albright, uh, the guys who played horns with Earth, Wind & Fire, Paul Jackson Jr., who lived across the street from me. Uh, all of these people, you know, there was this convergence of people from, you know, uh, who had the music and the center of their understanding of the music that they wanted to play that was part of the contemporary palette was the understanding that the quote unquote classical music of that was jazz. So we had that bond of learning how to play that music to offer vocabulary to whatever other kinds of musics that we would relate to. And for me, it was particularly um, important because I didn't see myself, although I love classical music, and I was pretty good at it, I didn't see myself doing that. So I didn't know what I was gonna do with the musical um, training that I had had, nor with the, the idea of what music could be about. And it was that experience through field trips, not only to see the Philharmonic, but also to go to the jazz clubs that allowed me to say, oh, there are a lot of different ways that this understanding of what music can be about can can not only bring joy, you know, to my life, but also offer joy to so many other, other other people who listen to a lot of different styles. Wow. Thank you for going through that. I appreciate it. Sure. And man, the teacher makes such a difference. You know, I had plenty of music lessons and so many teachers through the years for, you know, saxophone, guitar, and what have you. And man, the ones that um, didn't relate to you, 
you know, I mean, as a kid, it's so important and so critical. Mm -hmm. So you were very lucky to find someone like that. I really was. Um, and I remember that Columbia Music Club well, you know, like a penny for like 20 records or whatever. And then they would bill you and all that uh, <laughs> from a bygone era for sure. You know, that's right. <laughs> um, so as you were coming up with that, you know, who were your some some of your top inspirations uh, on the keys and maybe just overall musically that we would know? Well, you mentioned Herbie Hancock. Uh, a few minutes ago, and I would say that by the time I came in contact with his music, I was old enough to have had a lot of, um, you know, time listening through my parents playing all these records. And so I, the, the, the idea of what jazz represented, and especially the idea of improvisation, was something that was, a, there were concepts that weren't foreign to me, but I didn't understand how they worked. But I could hear things and I knew that through the listening, you know, that there were things that really, um, you know, just uh, made me feel good and made me want to know more. And I think by the time I got into Herbie, which was around the time of the late, late sixties, my parents had some of the Miles Davis stuff that he was with. And then of course the seventies um, and the MYDC band in particular, um, then I started to realize how important there were there were there were a lot of aspects to playing the piano and to being a good improviser that uh, he embodied. So stylistically, that became sort of a, 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 a centerpiece and sort of a, a bar to try to, you know, try to get to try. You try. It looks like that when it's done right. Try to get to that. That, of course, opened up so many other things. It sent me backwards. It sent me to Wynton Kelly. It sent me to Oscar Peterson. It sent me to Bill Evans. And it pushed me forward. It, Herbie, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett, George Duke, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there were a lot of influences, but I think that he was at the center of that kind of discovery for me. Then people who were not necessarily keyboard players who made a tremendous impact. Stevie Wonder made a tremendous impact on me. Um, it's like I came up with his music. Now he was, he was, you know, pretty young at the at, at the time, but this it, phenom, you know, um, it was like hit after hit after hit after hit, and it was the quality of the songs that really always intrigued me. Um, same thing with Smokey Robinson; the quality of the songs was like, you know, wow, that's that's an unforgettable melody, that's an unforgettable lyric, you know, things like this. Of course, in again through listening to my parents' collection. I heard other great songs. I heard Perry Como. I heard uh, I heard uh, Billy Eckstein. Um, you know, I was hearing Sarah Vaughn. I was hearing Ella Fitzgerald and the, and the repertoire that they were doing. Um, Frank Sinatra. And then I started listening to Frank's arrangements. And I was like, ooh, they were so exciting. And a lot of those were Quincy Jones's arrangements. And I was like, wait a minute, whoa, I've heard this name before. Because by this time, Quince, by the time I got around to understanding more about Quincy, he was also having his own recordings and doing television and things like this. So every time I got into somebody, it sent me backwards and forwards. And uh, so those were people that I related to. And now when I hear Duke Ellington, when I hear, you know, uh, Brahms, when I, you know, when I hear... Um, just about anything that really touches me, it's going to um, hit me on several different levels. Other kinds of music, Brazilian music, Mil Milton Nascimento, for example. Um, so long-winded answer to say, it's a whole lot of folks. <laughs> well, two of my very favorites for sure, Herbie and uh, Stevie. Um, you know, who do you remember who you saw that was sort of a, a name, a recognizable name that you first saw perform that you found really inspiring? Yeah. Uh, Sly Stone. Sly, it was Sly and the Family Stone. Then. And they opened for Parliament Funkadelic. Hmm. And these shows were like, not only were they, you know, the, 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 the dance music of, of, of my teens, you know, but also just the way they put on a show, the way that the entertainment was not just about playing the songs. It was about 
offering these presentations of the songs that made the spectacle just that much more uh, interesting. Um, you know, later I went to see the police, you know, with Sting and all. And uh, Michael Jackson was sitting right behind me. Mm. And so I also saw that other people who I admired, uh, you know, were catching some of that same, you know, energy. And being in Los Angeles, it wasn't unusual, you know, to go to a concert and everybody who was dialed in to what was going on with that music, they would they would show up. And we kind of all shared in that acknowledgement that, yeah, this is happening. Um, and Earth, Wind & Fire, for sure. Earth, Wind & Fire um, actually um, used to rehearse at my, at my high school when they were for, they, they had been around for a minute, but, you know, there was still a fledgling band. This was early 70s. And uh, my high, one of my high school band directors, Reggie Andrews, was a friend of Maurice White's and said, well, man, if you need a place to rehearse, after hours, I can let you into the multipurpose room. And I'll get the kids to help to carry some of your stuff in and set up and stuff. So we we were there and then we stayed and watched. And the band, you know, was very gracious and everybody was very nice. They 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 couldn't pay for the time, so they offered to pay play the prom. It happened to be my high school prom. <laughs> so Earth Wind and Fire plays my high school prom. Wow. And then that summer they blew up. Boom! Mighty Mighty came out. And they never look back. So that's a story, too, because watching the development of a group, watching the development of a sound, watching the interaction and the community between them in order to find that 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 sound and watching Maurice work with them. That was very powerful for me and kind of was one of the things that brought a lot of things together uh, for how I would approach my own music. Wow, that is some prom. <laughs> I know. It's off the chain. Uh, what high school did you go to? This was Elaine Leroy Locke High School in uh, in Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles in Watts. Very and it was nice. relatively new school at that time uh, because it was built in 1968, 69. And, uh, you know, so I was only maybe the uh, in the third or fourth class, you know, that that rolled through there. Better known as Locke, though, right? Locke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I went to Santa Monica High School. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. Did you go to a, a mothership show or a funk fest? Is that what that was? Or it was it was one of those shows that was at the forum. It was just a pack. It was a package, you know, two artists, bands on the same night. Mm -mm. It was amazing. Yeah, I didn't see Sly back then, but I did see Parliament many times. Mm -hmm. Um, so you got your record deal with, uh, prestige. Um, how excited were you? Actually, I was pretty calm about it all. Looking back, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. But I, I think it has to do with the fact that I was seen at the Monterey Jazz Festival of 1972. Our high school lock, you know, we had a jazz band and we used to play in a lot of competitions. And one of them was the Monterey competition. And at that time, you had two categories. You had the band, big band category, and then you had the combo category. Well, our, our band didn't win, but I entered a com the combo category also, and my combo did win. And the prize is that you get to appear at the festival. So we were on the festival, and that's where a lot of people, you know, at that scale, that's where a lot of people, you know, uh, heard me. And we're interested in signing. Uh, there were companies that were interested in signing me, but I was not. I wasn't that keen on on the idea because I didn't feel like I was ready for any of that. You know, I was getting ready to graduate from high school and go on to college. And that just, you know, my the people that I listened to, they were just so way up here. It's like, I don't belong on a record. I'm not. Mm. I'm not there yet. Um, but I did need money to go to school. So when sort of the initial fervor died down a little bit fantasy uh, approached me the prestige side of the of the label and said listen you know we can do a really easy um situation where you would have you know creative control to do what you want to make you comfortable it's not a huge huge deal so you you know the idea of you feeling like it's a huge huge label and all of that the things that were scaring me the most 
um, you know, they seemed to put me at ease and it was Oren Keep News, uh, the late Oren Keep News, great um, uh, champion of, 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 of jazz and, 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 and recording artists, um, said, listen, you know, think about it. And so we did. And that's where I went. And you worked with Reggie Andrews, who you mentioned right off yes, the bat. Yes, right off oh, the bat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that must have helped with the comfort. It really did. It really did. And I think, again, the idea of, you know, just feeling uh, that there was not a lot of pressure and just to do what I wanted to do. And uh, so it was, it was a very, a very enriching environment with just the right degree of challenge. You know, I could I could call on people that I knew, call on my friends. And of course, from the label's perspective, they could put me with some of their more established artists also. So there was that that challenge there. And the first person they put me with was Joe Henderson. <laughs> so he ended up playing masterful, masterfully on, uh, on my first record. Yeah, you had incredible support musically right off the bat. I mean, other people, uh, and Duga was on there, and uh, uh, just about everybody was a name, you know. Yeah, um, I, during that time, I had I was I was doing more and more um, session work in LA, and I was also um, playing on on certain gigs. So I met some some amazing musicians. So during that time, I met Lee Rittenauer and Harvey Mason and uh, Freddie Hubbard. And Hubert Laws, you know, and these are people that um, I had the good fortune to have a lot of play with a lot of them, you know, on their records or mine. And I'm sure all the while you're just soaking up everything you can like a sponge and just, you know. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Did you feel like uh, at some level you kind of had to pinch yourself that you were just immersed in that? So every day, quick. every day, still, <laughs> still. The idea of being able to play at a certain level, be challenged at a certain level, um, you know, it, it, and, 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 and offer the best that you can in that moment to give and surrender to what the music requires, whatever that is of you in that time. That's been sort of the mantra for my entire, uh, my entire career. And in, and in, and in maintaining that as the, uh, as the focus, it's it's offered me so many opportunities in varied situations to work with various artists of different levels, of different you know uh, uh, strata and of different uh, categories. But the common denominator is the uh, you know uh, the music and the love of the music and trying to address that with such um, energy, you know, and dignity. Mm-hmm. And that first record uh, was in 74. Then you did two more for Prestige. And the other two, um, you know, you could see like more funk kind of coming into the mix. And then the last one had some vocal. Um, how did you feel about how you were progressing musically and also bringing some singing into it at that point? Well, I was always, I think the my orientation was usually at, from the standpoint of the composer or the songwriter. And whatever the music required, whatever color it it, it seemed like would best pre, uh, present it or best illustrate it and animate it, that's what I would do. So vocals came into the mix. It wasn't as if it was something foreign to me. I definitely, you know, I love to sing. I'd sung before and other contexts. But when I started writing and then being able to experiment a little bit with some other things, you know, uh, that became another, other colors in my palette that I could offer, whether I sang the songs or not. So um, that's kind of how that got started. And it became a thing. It just became a thing. It was organic uh, in the way that, you know, it uh, allowed me to just have those other colors in my palette and be able to put them to use. And the blending, I believe that you're alluding to as far as still wanting to play and still, you know, the, 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 the uh, tradition informing, the tradition of jazz informing a lot of the way I would approach particularly the improvisation aspects, but also the tradition of composition and the traditions that involve structure and things like that, helping to inform this new way of approaching it, because I was also at the same time, this was happening. I was doing the dances and parties and, 
watching American Bandstand and Soul Train just like everybody else. So that was a part of, you know, my development as well. And uh, somehow that convergence, um, I, I had a platform to be able to offer that convergence. Did you feel comfort on stage vocally at first, or did it take a while for you to kind of get comfortable with that? Oh, it's still, um, you know, it, it's, it still amazes me that, 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 that there are people who actually only know me as a vocalist, because again, it was uh, an artistic choice to be able to offer that as a means by which, you know, the, 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 the piece, the composition could come across. And just like anything else, you know, uh, yeah, at first, you know, you're a little like it's it's a little different. You know, it's. It's definitely wearing some different clothes, some different shoes, you know, they, they, they fit, but it's different. It feels different. It just took a little it took a little time. But I think as I learned. To surrender to the idea of performance and definitely had, you know, great people to encourage me and coach me and watched other great performers and saw how do they connect organic to them, organic to themselves? What, what is going on that allows for a person to, you know, really enjoy their performance? And um, it, some of those things, you know, I began to grasp and, and uh, it continues to make me a little less apprehensive about, about singing. <laughs> During those prestige years, also uh, a few of the other people we didn't mention that you had in there were Hubert Laws and um, James Gadsden and uh, some Headhunters connection with Bill Summers and uh, some Earth, Wind, Fire connection with Al McKay. Yeah, they every name that you mentioned, every it brings a smile to my face because we all had such a great time. I not only enjoyed working uh, with them, but I learned from them. You know, every situation that I was in, I was was a learning moment for me. Um, even if it was my own record and I, you know, passed out the music or I, or I was in charge or leading. And uh, it's kind of always been like that for me, that um, I always learn, you know, it's, it's really cool. Did you ever feel like it was a challenge to sort of assert yourself because of your youth being also being a female and, you know, just kind of you know, a lot of these guys were, you know, older and that kind of thing? Most of the musicians, you know, at least not to my, not straight to my face, they never made me feel less than or anything like that. If I could hold my own, then they, 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 I had already experienced what it felt like to have a peer group that was about let's get this done together and push each other. I that I experienced that in high school, so the cat was out of the bag. I didn't feel like. I, I, the, 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 that you could say no and not have a reason, you know? So uh, when I would show up, if there was a certain kind of hesitation or apprehension, once we started playing, that went away. I think it was because of my serious nature and commitment to the music and that people picked up on that and um, really helped me. I'll never forget that I had a, early on, I got a gig with Benny Golson great saxophone player. And he said, Quincy Jones told me to call you. And I was a little nervous about it because you're so young. But I need you to come over and I'm doing a, a, a local gig and I need for you to come by and let's play a little bit. So we did. And afterwards, he says, okay, this, this, this is good. And then he told me, this, that's when he told me the story that Quincy had said to call me. And I said, oh, well, I'm so honored that you did. He says, well, I started not to. But Quincy said, Benny, why won't you give her a call? Well, because she's so young. And he said, Benny, then teach her. And when he told me that, I said, wow, okay. <laughs> and he says, and now I'm really glad. And since that time, you know, we've become uh, friends and, and I've worked with him often. And I, I, I ask him for his advice and, things like that. But it's, it's like that all the time. You know, I think that there's the idea that you learn things and you pass those, that information, uh, you pass that information forward to people who are interested. 
So I didn't. So to answer your question, no, I didn't ever feel like it was a problem. I didn't run into any o- overt bias, let's say, until I started working in film and television. Mm-hmm. That's when it changed, because now I'm not necessarily maybe this is why I don't know. This is my hunch. No, I'm not dealing with musicians all the time. Mm-hmm. I'm dealing with people who maybe listen to music every now and then only uh, superficially at that. Um, who don't know necessarily the musical process and who maybe take for granted certain aspects of who's capable of doing something. So my name doesn't, didn't in that world, didn't necessarily give away gender. And it certainly didn't give away being a black person and, you know, just whatever bias anybody would have being short. I don't know, you know, whatever it was. I, so I would go in for these interviews, you know, for certain types of, of, of things. And it, you know, it might be an adventure film. It might be a love story. It might be a television special. It might be anything. But I would get the call to be able to go in and interview. And I would always get the, the look of surprise. It started being a little amusing after a while because it was always if the person didn't recognize the name from recordings or didn't know anything about this side of my musical persona, it came as a shock. When I walked through the door, <laughs> and like I said, it, you know, I I learned to t- I learned to take it in stride because I said, well, I guess this means I'm supposed to try to bust this door down at some point, you know, just by trying to do good work. Yeah, well, fortunately, I mean, I guess you were so successful in music that uh, having a challenge like that was easier to deal with. I'm thinking because you already knew what you were capable of. You know what I mean? Yes. No, you're exactly right. I agree. Yeah. yeah. But good for you, you know, changing those perceptions. Still working on it. <laughs> yes. To work in progress. Uh, so when you switched uh, labels and um, uh, 78 Patrice came out, what were your, like your aspirations ultimately for yourself as a solo artist? And, you know, how much of that was you, how much of that, if any, was like management? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the label was starting a certain arm of it that was wanting to do, I guess, a more commercially accessible kind of, to use the only term that they were using, jazz. They wanted music that had jazz sensibilities but was accessible to a wider public. So, and this this is pre-Quiet Storm, definitely pre-Smooth Jazz, all of that. You know, this is, this is the very beginning of the idea that music that was maybe not always vocally based or music that included instrumental breaks and solos and things like that, could be performed with an aesthetic that took a nod to the tradition, but also celebrated the idea that other people who maybe didn't listen to jazz because of whatever would pay attention because there was there were aspects of the music that they could that were easy for them to to accept and grasp. So this was right up my alley because I'm a product of that ex- those those two if they weren't extremes to me they were all on the same on the same line to me i could hear this i could hear the 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 that these musics were branches of the same tree that's the way i had been always trained anyway so when they came and said we would like you to you know sing more and but still play so i i use that as an opportunity to not only do that but take my own personal growth to the next le- level by by doing what it was I wanted to do, which was to arrange and orchestrate. Because what I thought I wanted to do was be, from the beginning, a film composer. I wanted to work in film and television as a composer. The whole playing thing, the whole recording thing, and all of that were deviations from that particular uh, script that I had for myself in terms of what I wanted to do. Things that I needed to do because aspects of that those 
various uh, nuances in terms of vocabulary, that's what makes great composers, especially for film and TV. So to be participate in these different things was a part of the building blocks for the kind of composer that I that I thought I wanted to be. Um, and those things, some of those things took off like this. But like I said, the having being on a label that was larger, having some experience with what that would mean, having the assignment, so to speak, of creating records that met a certain mark. Also having to be true to myself and use that opportunity and that platform to enhance and develop my own multiple voices. So it worked out for me great. That's quite a master plan. It all like the mad scientist in the laboratory planning <laughs> it all out, you know? Well, totally didn't know that that was how it was going to go down. But I think having a sense of of uh, each thing meaning had the potential to meet to to allow for the next thing to happen that was that was where i think i was the most fortunate that each thing organically led to the next who are a couple of the film or tv composers that you admired oh uh, well you know we talked about quincy i liked his work a lot i also like jerry goldsmith very much and uh of course, you know, John Williams and then, bef you know, before that, Bernard Herrmann. Uh, you know, I I was, I always wanted to pay attention to who who was doing the writing. Elmer Bernstein, you know, I wanted to know who, who wrote that. You know, how, how they think of that for this, you know. So it was super. And I was a big fan of, of so many of the uh, television themes, you know, how you could be in the kitchen making a sandwich and it was an you era the of you hear this theme song and you oh, yeah. gotta go, you know oh, I yeah. said, oh, that's straight genius right there you know <laughs> to be able to pour into that 30 or 60 second you know theme something that would give you the character of the show you know really cool yeah quincy did some of the best of those too yep um so, you know, that first record had Hang It Up on there and uh, great, you know, brought all that together you're talking about, you know, some little bit of jazz keyboards and the funk vibe and the vocals and it took off. And I was a DJ back then. I was still in high school, but I was just starting my DJ life. And, uh, you know, all those 12 inch singles that you put out back then, beginning <laughs> with Hang It Up, you know, those were definite staples and appreciated uh -huh. to keep the house parties and the clubs moving. Uh what do you remember about, you know, just the experience of like those recording sessions? Well, first of all, they were live. You know, when we would say we would be overdubbing, we, we were typically overdubbing on a track that had been cut live. And our overdubs included your background vocals, any lead vocal that you had and strings and horns that, that, that you might have. But but your rhythm section, you know, your, your backbone of everything else was recorded and we were all there at the same time. So the idea of finding the right pocket and being able to, to nail that since that's the foundation on which all that dance music, especially was going to be built. It was thrilling. It was fun. It was really, really fun. And I had, you know, masters of the of, of 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 that that I was able to work with. You know, you mentioned James Gadsden and you talked about Indugu and um, you know, Freddie Washington, who we're we're peers, but we came up listening to the same music and, and we played a lot together in different groups and bands. Uh, Charles Meeks was another bass player, uh, son of Vi Red, the saxophonist. And, you know, she was just um, incredibly funky and had a beautiful sound. And, you know, uh, uh, Charles inherited her, inherited some of her musicality and wit and charm. And so we played in bands together. So Al McKay, you know, rhythm, you know, Paul Jackson Jr. later on and my relationship with, you know, Rittenauer and, you know, all of these things uh, came together, you know, to to allow for us to be able to make music together. And so the sessions were really fun. 
Wow, it sounds like it was a blast. Larry Williams, too, another one. Yeah, He's Larry Williams. Oh, yes, yeah. he did quite a few of the horn stuff with me. And because uh, Sea Wind, I had been introduced to Sea Wind by Harvey Mason. And we became friends. And then I asked them to play on the records. And then it was later that I found out that Larry was also a monster keyboard player. So, you know, it was it was great fun. It was great fellowship. I'll, again, an environment where there was music happening and learning happening in terms of how to get there. And uh, we had some pretty successful times. How'd you feel when the record kind of blew up, you know, and uh, how'd you feel hearing it on the radio first time? Well, it was it was interesting because even though I'd heard myself on the radio before on other people's records and on some of the earlier records, this was different because it was on the record in a rotation that allowed for it to be played a lot. So I would be hearing it and I would, it was, it, I, I'm still not used to it. I mean, want to hear myself on the radio. If I hear myself, you know, over speakers or something like that, I'm, why do I know this? Oh, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, so it's a, it's one of those kinds of feelings that's, that I don't think I'll ever, I'll ever get over. It's, 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 it's very, very cool. And that record did really well up to a point. And then I had several other records that did really well up to a point. And I started wondering, like, okay, so how do we always get to this point? And then afterwards, and that afterwards was it being played at the radio level, at the pop radio level. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of during that time also, there was a big movement with crossover, you know, and it began to influence a lot of the ways in which the record company would or would not support you. So being able to go out on tour, to be able to get tour support, to be able to do that much a little bit later than that, videos and things like that. A lot of that was based on how the records did, not only on a a particular chart, but whether or not it was on multiple charts and how high. So this kind of took on another sensibility that had to be developed also about how to posture and place yourself in the quote unquote marketplace so that your record would have have the opportunity if the audience felt it. You can't make people do stuff, but if the audience felt it, they needed to be exposed to it. So that became another interesting part of uh, of our development. And how important was that to you versus the label and management? I mean, did you also feel like you wanted to really cross over and have more mass appeal, or were you kind of happy where you you know, in the, in the niche you had, or where, were you, where was your head with it? Well, you know, my f- head was in trying to, it, it, it wasn't the goal of crossing over just to cross over. It was because if I don't, I can't get the money to go tour. Mm-hmm. If I don't, I can't get a, vi- I can't do a video. I'm not allowed to do one. If I don't, I won't have access to some of the same things that my peers who have managed to do that have access. So the the question was, so what do you need to do in order to do that? And could I meet that criteria? Because I I felt like the music could, but there was a mechanism that was maybe in the way. And I started asking questions and finding out, doing some research. And then I was told about something called independent promotion, where you don't wait on the record company to make the decision because they usually are making it not ahead of the curve or anticipating what's going to happen. It's usually reactionary. And for most people, when you react like that, it's too late. So um, by the time we got to Forget Me Nots and we knew that the record company, for whatever reason, didn't hear it as a, they didn't hear it like we heard it. <laughs> we 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 said we know we got something. We think we got something. We did our homework. We did our research. We took it to clubs. We did that. Nah, nah. We knew. We felt like well, somebody's going to want this, but the record company was like, well, nobody's going to want this. <laughs> so, so we decided to you know put our few little pennies together. Myself, Charles Mims Jr., um, Freddie Washington. And we put our little pennies together and we did so many weeks of independent promotion, like three. And uh, just to make sure it got to radio. We didn't want it to be on the sidelines because we people didn't get it or didn't believe it or believe in it. 
So we said, well, what would happen if right out of the gate there was the, an effort and maybe we have to make that effort? So that's what we did. And the record just took off and took off and took off and took off and took off. And uh, ultimately, uh, it proved that, you know, if you believe in something, then you need to stand stand up. You faced challenges like that on that record, even though um, "Haven't You Heard" was such a big hit. Yeah. See, when we lost, when we didn't lose, "Haven't You Heard," but when ha- when "Haven't You Heard" didn't do that, we said, "Okay, enough. Something needs to change because that's that one didn't happen. It was like." And when I say didn't happen, I mean, do what was necessary to ensure that these other things uh, would 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 happen. Not being able to see that go down with a record that like that, let us know, Okay, there needs to be a different. Approach to on our end. To. um, Give it the best shot it had. It, it, it can have. You know, all you can do is set it in place. You know. Yeah. Well, it paid off at least that time. It really did. Sure. Yeah. It really did, and it's still paying off. <laughs> and big lessons came from that. You know, came from that whole experience about what that kind of uh, idea about the the market marketing. And that kind of idea, what that Im- involves, how much time it involves, the not just the, the the monetary consideration, but that of time and planning, and having that B plan ready when you and being able to respond to whatever a trend is very very quickly and effectively. Oh man, it was it was amazing, uh, amazing time. And it was a time too when there was so much change in the industry, you know, moving from disco into the eighties and with more synthesizer sounds and and also videos, music videos starting to take hold. And I mean it was and, and corporate music industry and all these things were going on then. It was such a turbulent time musically and so challenging for a lot of artists to stay on top of that and, and continue success. So yeah. so much to your credit that you cut through all that. Well, I learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned is was the, the, the you know, and we, we, we say it a lot, but when you when you live through the specifics of it, you know, it, had, it takes on another meeting and then there's the music and there's the music business. And the music business, there's a there are a lot of layers and things to have to also consider. And, uh, you know, um it's one of those kinds of situations that can certainly enhance what's up in terms of a particular uh, uh, song or album or, or project or CD, but uh, yeah, there's a price to pay mm-hmm. because the closer you are to really trying to understand what all is involved, sometimes it can really, um, at, at the very least, it can, it can uh, modify what the creative uh, aspects might be. Yeah. For can influence sure. it in, and can influence it in a way that is not necessarily uh, bad, but not necessarily healthy either. Yeah. The word compromise comes to mind, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, you had so much variety on your records and I know that was no accident. And uh, you know, I mean, to your credit, those tracks, you know, were just great no matter how you cut it. I mean, do you remember, uh, since you jumped to, I want to talk about a couple other tracks too, but um, forget me not. When you first kind of heard that taking shape in the studio, how'd you feel about it? Well, it took shape at home. We, I was, Freddie State lived with my family for a while when he was transitioning from being a, in the Bay Area and wanted to be in Los Angeles to, to try to do a, uh, more studio work. And we had become friends, you know, playing a few gigs and everything. And one day he just called me and said, ask your mother if I could stay on her couch. I got to get out. I got to, I want to get out of here and I want to come down there and try to do some stuff. And to my surprise, my mom and dad said, yeah, okay. 
<laughs> they had met him already and, you know, liked him a lot and knew he was trying to be about something. And one of the things that they always instilled in both my sister and I is when you see people who are serious about what they're trying to do and they need a hand, if you have the hand to give it, you give it. You just you just do it. And so they walked their talk. They actually did that for Freddie. So we played every day. Every day. Sometimes we'd have a gig, sometimes we wouldn't. But we played every day. And one and we recorded every day. I had a little four track, little T act four track machine. And whenever we would play, I would just let the tape roll because might come up with something and you want to hear how you're doing. How are you sounding on the drums? How am I sounding on the guitar? I'll play bass now. You play drums. You play keys. I'll play guitar. You know, we would do this all the time and it was for fun, but it was for practice. And one day he played this bass line. And I said, what is that? He says, I don't know. I'm just making up stuff. I said, what? play it again. You know, and if I had any skill of that, if there was any fairy dust magic in it, it was to be able to hear something and we'll go, Ooh, wait a minute, you know? So we wrote, we put it down and then we, you know, he took it and developed it a little bit. And I put some chords to it that were so simple because the baseline was so complete. And then the story evolved. I think he played it for a friend, Terry McFadden, and she came up with sending you forget me nots to help you to remember. And we were like, whoa, that play on words is kind of clever, kind of like that. And then wrote the story and, 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 and finished it up and played it for different people. You know, what are you guys working on? Oh, this, this. And every time we would play it, even if even in a collection of unfinished things, it would stand out. And people really like that, you know. Uh, so I decided to put it on the record, of course, and on the album. And before we turned it in. We took it to a couple of clubs. We had a couple of friends who were DJs at clubs. Hey, look, man, between after Michael Jackson's record, everybody's on the floor. Put this on right after it. If the floor clears, then you know, okay. If it doesn't, you know, you have something. And the floor didn't clear. People stayed on the floor and kept dancing. Never heard it before. And it was mixed between some stuff, you know. So we felt pretty good about it. And we recorded it. And it was delivered right along with number one and remind me and um, you know the other things that are on that album and the record company didn't like it at all none of it <laughs> oh man so we were like okay guess guess we're gonna work on this independent promotion thing for real <laughs> wow <laughs> um what what would you say you know what, what was your temperament or mentality or approach what what is patrice russian like back then uh in in studio uh let's see i i i don't think it has even changed that much from what i am right now when i'm in the studio or when we're working on music that's my that's my focus is to bring excellence to whatever we're doing and my best Means of communication in terms of that happens to be through the music. So there's an, a balancing act that I learned by observing great artists, great producers, great people. Uh, the commonality there is to have this balance going on between reaching a certain, having a certain something in mind and reaching a certain level. And at the same time, being ready to surrender to the moment and having the chops and the competence to go there immediately. So what I, when I go into a session or when I'm working with, with other musicians, whether it's a recorded situation or live, it doesn't really matter. I'm there to serve that those moments i'm there to serve the music and i also learned that some of the best leaders are such because they're also good team players good followers they hear where it's going to go and they have the capacity to read between the lines and go there and 
if everybody's coming from there, you're usually going to get a sum of the parts that is so much higher than what anybody could have imagined. So that's how I try to manage, you know, those kinds of sessions, those kinds of, 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 of gatherings and, and, and my life really. Do you think others in those sessions would maybe call you a perfectionist or a, you know, how do you think they would look upon, you know, when you're producing, especially? Well, I don't know. And I don't know that I care that much <laughs> because at the end of the day, whatever the components were that got us there, you know, uh, if the, if, if the end game results in a, in the quality and the, energy that you went into it and the excitement that you went into it with. And I guess, you know, but I don't know. I don't know what people would call it. Uh, and like I said, I don't know that it matters that much to me. Yeah. I don't, I don't want people to, I don't want people to mislabel. I don't want to be called something I'm not, but, but at the same time, um, you know, the music is why we're there. So. Was the label more on board with Haven't You Heard when they heard that? No. no. <laughs> I mean, when you say on board, that depends on what you mean. If, 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 you, if on board means we know we have an artist that has been doing some credible music, that we see the results in the marketplace, we see that there's viability we see that there's interest and therefore we're going to go as soon as soon as this is out there we're going to presuppose that if we put our, our marketing behind it in a way that is proactive we will definitely see our return because we have the proof that that's that that's happening if you if that's what you mean by on board then the answer to that is no i never i didn't have that i had to prove it every time and we felt like that and didn't know any better for a long time until after haven't you heard say oh, okay now we this now we know better who were some of the acts at that time that you're finding finding inspiring you know was it still stevie wonder was it michael jackson who well, of course, um, Stevie was always doing all kinds of things like that. Michael Jackson, yes, because, you know, I guess we were kind of like contemporaries, you know. Uh, and by this time, Prince had come along, too. In fact, uh, the last single that I had for Elektra was called Feel So Real. And on the R&B charts, it was sitting right between When Doves Cry hmm. and uh, Tell Me I'm Not Dreaming, which was a duet between Jermaine and Michael, Jermaine Jackson and Michael Jackson. It, it was number two. And so to watch the label at that point, it said, okay, so this is where we're going to tap out. And Prince is going to go this way and Michael's going to go this way. And I'm number two right between them. What you going to do? And when there was hesitation, <laughs> you know, then, you know, again, for whatever reason, um, you know, it just meant that it just wasn't time, I guess, for there to be that kind of partnership, which I was expecting by that time uh, to have, you know. Uh, with a label and it wasn't adversarial it just wasn't proactive in my favor mm -hmm. there's much more to this great truth and rhythm interview just continue on to the next part of the episode also be sure to subscribe to this channel if you've already done so please share it with friends and become a member by joining truth and rhythm on patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net Thank you very much.